you're listening to the Telltale channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. In this podcast, we're going to talk about Doug the Bounty Hunter working his way into prophecy among evangelicals. Some of the bizarre stuff supposed prophet of God Julie Green has said about Donald Trump and others. Pastor Mark Burns and his unhealthy obsession with Kenneth Copeland. We also take voicemails. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. If you want to send an email instead, the email address is telltalemailbag at gmail.com. I'm sure you guys probably saw the thumbnail coming into this. We need to talk about Joe Biden's cognitive abilities, his uh, the possibility that maybe he has dementia. I've had a lot of people asking me about this lately, so you know what? Let's talk about it. A while back, there was this clip making the rounds in right-wing YouTube, right-wing Twitter, and, and places like that. Let's just watch the clip and see what happens. This is Joe Biden meeting the Pope. Thank you for that. So uh, in this clip, Biden had just given the Pope a coin. Thank you for that. It was a famous African-American baseball player. So here's the premise of the clip. Biden says... You're a famous African-American baseball player while shaking his hand, right? And then there's just complete silence after. Baseball player in America. Somebody walks up and talks to the Pope. And then it cuts off. And here's another clip that was talking about the same thing. Joe Biden has a total mental breakdown during his visit with the Pope. American President Joe Biden tells the Pope, you're a famous African-American baseball player in America with a clown face over Biden. J. Biden to Pope, you're the famous African-American baseball player in America. You're the famous African-American baseball player in America. So this is from October 29th, 2021, I think. This has been going around all over the place for a while now, and it is one of the reasons why people believe that Joe Biden has dementia. Now let's watch the original clip in its entirety. Thank you for that. It is a famous African-American baseball player in America. I know. Afro-Americano, Afro-Americano. And he didn't get to play. How about that? It was cut off right before a story was told. Isn't that interesting? This is the Pope's translator because he doesn't speak English very well. Joe Biden walked up to the Pope to tell him a story. He realized the Pope didn't speak English very well, so he spoke a sentence, waited for the translator to come up, and then told the next sentence. That's actually what happened here. Does Joe Biden have some kind of a cognitive disability? Probably a little. The dude's like 79 years old or something now, or 80, somewhere in there. I'm sure he's slowed down a little bit. He does not have dementia by any stretch of the imagination. But thanks to clips like this right here. Thank you for that. It was a famous... African-American baseball player. Thanks to those clips, it's spread far and wide that the guy can't cobble together a sentence, that he doesn't know where he is or what's happening in any given moment. It is pure, unadulterated propaganda. Now, there are also a couple of examples of Joe Biden not being able to, like, get a sentence out he kind of skips over certain words or whatever that's because he's had a stutter since he was a child and the fact that he's capable of holding a press briefing at all with few to no stutters is a testament to how hard he's worked over the course of his life to eliminate the existence of that stutter so all of the Joe Biden dementia stuff, in my opinion, which is based in fact and information, 
is pure propaganda. Let's watch the rest of this just so that you guys have the context necessary to understand exactly what was happening here. So he walks up to the Pope. He's about to tell a story. He says, there was not, you are a famous African-American baseball player. He said, there was a famous African-American baseball player. It was the start of a story. And he didn't get to play in the Major League Baseball until he was 45 years old because he was black. Non gli hanno permesso di giocare nella Lega. So he didn't get to play in the major leagues, I think, or whatever, because he was black. He was a pitcher. And usually pitchers lose their arm when they're 35. He pitched to win on his 47th birthday. The press walked in the locker room and said his name was Satchel Page. Si chiamava Satchel Page. Allora gli giornalisti sono andati nello spogliatoio. The commanding officer said, Satch, no one's ever pitched to win at age 47. How do you feel about pitching to win on your birthday? E tutti hanno detto, nessuno ci è mai riuscito a fare questo a 47 anni. Come ti senti averlo fatto al giorno del tuo compleanno? And he looked at me and said, boys, that's not how I look at age. So anyway, the point is, it was just propaganda designed to make you think that the guy has some, cogn uh, some kind of a cognitive impairment. As far as I can tell, Joe Biden does not have any kind of cognitive impairment. He's just some older guy who shows his age to some degree. There are no early signs of dementia or any of that stuff. But I'll tell you how we can know for sure if he really does have dementia. And this applies to Trump, too. Dementia usually comes in three stages. There's the early stage, the middle stage, and the late stage, okay? Each stage generally takes about two years. So from the first signs, you have two years before you reach the middle stage. Two more years until you reach the late stage, and then two more years of that. So when do these people believe that Joe Biden started showing signs of cognitive impairment? Roughly around the time the primaries came along, back in 2019, right? I would say, 2019. So by this point, if Joe Biden really did have some cognitive impairment, we should see him breaking down completely and being incapable of recognizing where he is and things like that. There are different types of dementia, by the by. Alzheimer's is one of them. Lewy body dementia is another they are never super specific when they accuse Joe Biden of having dementia, of what type he may have. But there are different stages here. So the early stage is mild. Uh, common difficulties include coming up with the right word or name, remembering names when introduced to new people, having difficulty performing tasks in social work or I'm sorry, in social or work settings, forgetting material that was just read, losing or misplacing a valuable object experiencing increased trouble with planning or organizing. Middle stage is where we would be right now with Joe Biden if he actually did have it, because it's been at least three years since these accusations popped up, right? Being forgetful of events or personal history, feeling moody or withdrawn, especially, especially in socially or mentally challenging situations, being unable to recall information about themselves like their address or telephone number, uh, experiencing confusion about where they are or what day it is, requiring help choosing proper clothing for the season or occasion, having trouble controlling their bladder, experiencing changes in sleep patterns, showing an increased tendency to wander and become lost, demonstrating personality and behavioral changes, including suspiciousness and delusions or compulsive repetitive behavior like hand wringing or tissue shredding. Now, the far right Trump supporters are going to look at this list and pick out a single instance of uh, or a single example of everything on this list for Joe Biden. In my opinion, he's not he, he isn't even in early stage dementia, in my opinion, not even close. I have not seen the signs necessary to convince me that he has any kind of cognitive impairment beyond just being a little bit older. I'm not a psychologist. I don't have a PhD in this or anything like that. I have a two-year degree in psychology, but we didn't cover this. It was 
focused on substance abuse counseling. Either way, um, despite the fact that I'm not a, a qualified professional and have no place to like diagnose anybody or anything like that, I just don't see it. I just don't. And this same thing applies to Donald Trump. We started seeing weird stuff happen to the guy back in, I don't know, 2018 maybe? Best case scenario, let's say each stage takes three years, right? It's 2022 right now. We should start seeing Donald Trump exhibiting signs like this in mild stage. He should be in the mild phase right now. Um, best case scenario. By 2024, when he's running again, by 2025, when the next president is inaugurated, whether, whether that's Biden or Trump or anybody at all, they should be, hypothetically, Don Trump or Biden, completely incapable of functioning by the time the next presidential inauguration takes place. This is a slow progressing disease in a sense, but six years is not all that long when you think about it, especially when you're dealing with like presidential elections and stuff. I am very hesitant to accept the claim that anybody has dementia, um, particularly Joe Biden. It's completely unreasonable. So anyways, let's listen to the first voicemail I have here because somebody had a question for me. Let's see what they had to say. Hey Owen, this is Andrew from Saskatchewan, Canada. I just have a question just related to like um, a far right conspiracy theory about um, Joe Biden having um, dementia and stuff like that. Like, of course, I know that it's not true, and yeah, yeah, you know, like obviously Joe Biden doesn't have dementia, but like, where where did the um, conspiracy originate? Like, like how did it like get so prominent am amongst the far right, and not just the far right, but like the the right, the right itself, of course. Like in gen like the general right wing person, you know. I'd love to know what your what the answer is. Thanks. Well, I love what you do. Bye. Yeah, I appreciate the voicemail. The answer is, of course, clips like this. This was not the first one by any means. This, like I said, this whole thing with the baseball, this happened, I think, October twenty ninth, twenty twenty one. So that was a full nine months after he was inaugurated or 10 months. And it was a year, year and a half, maybe, after these accusations started flying around in the first place. There were super cuts that were released by, like, Republican PACs and, you know, influencers and people like that. Super cuts of Joe Biden, like, wandering around aimlessly and not being able to speak coherently and stuff. Like I said, it was all propaganda, it was all propaganda. The dude has never had a problem with this, in all seriousness. The reason I'm talking about this in the first place is because I saw a video released recently by a YouTuber that fancies themselves a psychologist. I don't know if they have like any of these qualifications, if they actually are a psychologist, or what, anything. I don't know anything about it. And I saw supercuts like this. Like this one right here. Dude played this baseball one in his video. When you play blatant propaganda like this, I'm sorry, I cannot take you seriously anymore. It's ridiculous, man. Pumpkin J, from what little I know from working with dementia patients for years, this behavior doesn't match that. Not a diagnosis, though. Right. Yeah, that's that, that was my impression of it also. It just does not seem like Biden has a... Biden has dementia. It doesn't seem like it at all. And honestly, I'm very skeptical of the idea that Trump has dementia also. Maybe? I've seen some weird things that make me wonder, but it's already been three or four years since we saw the first signs. He should have progressed a lot further by now. This is fundamentally the difference between uh, me, at the very least, and people on the far right, Trump supporters, when faced with evidence contrary to what you believe, you should be willing to move over to a position that relates to reality more closely. There's this concept called cognitive dissonance where there's a stress created in your brain when your beliefs and reality don't match up with each other. There are four different ways to alleviate that stress. 
uh, I forget what they all are, but a couple are convincing others that you're correct, despite the fact that you're very obviously not, or coming up with a new narrative, a new like idea of how the world works to account for the new information, no matter how ridiculous, right? So here we have an example of people who have a cognitive dissonance. They claim Joe Biden has dementia, and they've been claiming it for three years at least, maybe four. But we're faced with the reality that he doesn't have it every time he goes out there and gives a coherent speech, which he does fairly often, right? So how do they work around that? They claim that he has handlers. They claim that he's using a teleprompter as if any of this would matter ultimately if he really did have dementia and if he has for the past four years. As if they'd be able to fake it through, you know, full-blown dementia. It's ridiculous. But they build up these big, ridiculous stories and try to convert as many believers as possible because it alleviates the anxiety, the, the stress that comes with cognitive dissonance. Don't be like that. When faced with information that conflicts with the beliefs that you currently hold, change your beliefs. You don't have to believe this thing or that. You're not locked into this. You're not going to die if you find out that something that you believed isn't true. When you come to the realization that reality and what you believe are not connected to each other, change your beliefs to fit within reality. Please. Like, if people would just do that, the world would be a much better place. Instead, they come up with these bizarre stories that they spin up out of nothing to explain how they could have been right in the very beginning and reality, you know, is bent around that. It, by building conspiracy theories primarily. That's how this happens. They build these gigantic conspiracy theories to make it out like, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people involved in hiding all this information from you. It's insane. Just change your beliefs to match with reality. That's what I do. Why doesn't everybody do that? In the case of politics specifically, there are Republican politicians at the top who have a vested interest in reaffirming their constituents' delusions uh, because, you know, they can fundraise off of it. So no matter how ridiculous and obnoxious and unhinged from reality their beliefs are, these Republican politicians will keep reaffirming it. You know why? They win elections when they claim the election was stolen. They win elections when they claim Joe Biden has dementia. They win elections when they do this stuff. It's a positive feedback loop. It's nonsense from beginning to end, but they're incentivized to feed into the delusions. Don't be like that. I know it hurts. I know it sucks, but... At some point, you have to come to terms with the fact that you were wrong. There is no more important lesson in life that everybody should learn than to say, I was wrong. If you can learn to say that, you're in good shape. And he wrote down, wow. we are going, he wrote a course, to new Israel, new Israel. New Israel, and when they came off the ship, they didn't plant an American flag. They planted the Christian flag mm -hmm. on the soil. They dedicated, George Washington knelt and prayed, dedicated America where the Twin Towers stand. Julie M., does this New Israel guy think George Washington came over on the Mayflower? That's a good point. The answer is maybe. Everything that he said in that was complete nonsense. Like, none of it was based in reality. None of it. But he said it with such confidence that the people on the other end who were listening believed him. George Washington knelt and prayed, dedicated America where the Twin Towers stand. None of it's true. None of it. Or stood. That's where America came into covenant with Yahweh, with God, was where the Twin Towers stand. Wow. Isn't that something? That is where George Washington prayed, right? There's a chapel right outside the Twin Towers where George Washington... That one's true, that there's a chapel there. St. Paul's Chapel? 
George Washington did not kneel and pray in front of it. He didn't come into covenant with Yahweh or any of that garbage. It's all made up. That picture of him praying by the horse, that's where it happened. There is a picture of George Washington kneeling by a horse and praying. It's not based in reality. That didn't actually happen. That's where he dedicated our nation in covenant to God. If you will make us a great nation, deliver us from tyranny, then we will serve you. And he gave the nation to God at that point. Every signer of the Declaration of Independence were descendants of the tribes of Israel. Again, not true. None of it's true. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were descendants of the tribes of Israel? You've got to be kidding me. Literally, the only true things that this guy has said so far are there is a painting of George Washington and there is a chapel, St. Paul's Chapel, outside where the Twin Towers stood. That's the, the only true things in this. This is a three-minute video. We're 57 seconds in. I don't think he says another true thing. We can trace it. We know it. And here's the thing you've got to understand about Israel. Most people think of Israel when you say the word Israel. They think of Jews. I was a doctor of theology. No, again, a lie. I was the youngest ordained evangelist in America at 14 years old. Another lie. The youngest ordained evangelist in America was a guy named Marjo. He was a televangelist from the 1970s. Marjo Gortner. He was three years old when he was ordained. So even if you were ordained at 14, you were not the youngest by any stretch of the imagination. It's just lie after lie after lie with this guy. At 14 years old. Wow. I've lived for the Lord my whole life. and I Another lie. He actually spent some time as an insurance salesman and defrauded some people in a life insurance scam and went to jail for it for a while. So even that, even his claim... Let me show you his mugshot. Here you go. Shane Vaughn's mugshot. He was uh, an insurance agent and faced fraud charges. It's a big thing, and I don't want to get into the explanation, but he defrauded somebody out of a bunch of life insurance money. So anyway, uh, just everything out of the guy's mouth is a lie. Every word practically, but he's a televangelist, and people believe the things that he says. I was dumb as a box of rocks and didn't know it at 40 years old because I thought, that a Jew meant Israel and an Israel meant Jew. Until I started studying my Bible and I found out that the first mention of the word Jew in the Bible is them fighting against Israel. Wow. When you come to understand that Israel... You know, that seems like a stupid realization to come to, but he's about to tell you why it's so relevant. Come to understand that Israel is not Jews and Jews is not Israel. When you get that, here's what happens. All of a sudden, and I'll do it real fast. At one time, they were one nation. King Solomon died. King Jeroboam, King Rehoboam, there was a split. Yep. The Jews, the tribe of Judah, stayed in Jerusalem. Uh -huh. They kept the Sabbath. That's why they're still identifiable. They kept the Sabbath. That kept them identifiable for these thousands of years. I, this is another lie. The, the Jews are not descendants of the tribe of Judah. He's misunderstanding what that means. The Jews were descendants of Israel, the person named Israel. Uh, he had another name. I forget which one it was. It was Abraham, Isaac. Jacob was Israel. His name was changed to Israel. It's the sons of Jacob. That includes like Levi and uh, the Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah and... All of them. All 12. There were 12 of them total. So when he says Jews are the descendants of Judah, he's just full of it. The dude is completely full of it. Every word he says is a lie. However, there was 10 tribes. That there were 12 tribes. What is he talking about? That went to the north with King. Oh, God, see, I'm jumping the gun, man. I got to let them complete their sentence. I'm sorry about that. Let me just step back. Listen again. However, there was 10 tribes that went to the north with King Rehoboam in rebellion does he have evidence of this i've never heard this before in my life those tribes crossed over the caucasian mountains they were captivated by the germans they crossed over the caucasian oh are we out of time oh anyway so they crossed over i'll make it real quick <laughs> where they wound up at was the great british isles because the prophecy was that they would go mm -hmm. to the isles of the sea and from there we find those tribes 
making their way to the United States Thanks. of America. So there you go. There's Shane Vaughn's whole explanation that was nonsense from beginning to end. I think he said a total of three things that were true in the entire three minute clip. The fact that there's a chapel outside the 9-11 buildings. There was a painting of George Washington, though it wasn't based in reality. And that there were a total of 12 tribes of Israel. Did he even say that? I'm not sure that he did. I'm just trying to give the guy extra credit here. Uh, he's full of it from beginning to end, but there's the basis for the Trump religion. That's why this is a relevant clip in the first place, because it's the basis of the belief that Donald Trump can be a messiah. Hey, Owen, this is Alex. I have a, uh, a, a thought experiment, really, I guess you could call it, uh, for you. Um, so a lot of people say, you know, just follow me, uh, follow me if you would on this. A lot of people say, you know, the devil is the biggest trickster out there and so on, so on. Uh, the, you, know, you know, father of lies, all this stuff. What if, what if the devil actually tricked everybody into thinking that um, he was actually Jesus? And... You know, he died for everybody's sins, but really it was the devil because he's the trickster. Um, just a thought experiment that I've just kind of been chuckling at for a little while and uh, wanted to get your thoughts on it. It's, uh, I get a lot of interesting answers when I, when I bring this up to people, so I would love to hear yours. Thank you very much, and uh, in, enjoying the content, man. Thank you. Keep it up. Yeah, I appreciate that. Interesting uh, thought experiment. I have another one that's similar to that. I don't. Maybe this is what you were thinking, but let me lay this down for you. I heard from somebody a while back that they believed that the Bible was actually written by Satan. So there was an eternal struggle between God and Satan. And instead of God winning the battle, like the Bible says, actually Satan won the battle. And elevated himself up to God level, and then had his prophets write the Bible as though he was the good guy, when in reality, the person who lost the battle, which is God, was really the good guy. I mean, when you think about it, the person named as God in the Bible is an absolute monster. And God accuses Satan of all kinds of stuff that he never does. For example, Satan never told a lie in the entire Bible. You ever notice that? He told Adam and Eve, if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or whatever, they would know good and evil. They would gain understanding and knowledge and everything. And what happened? They did. Also, God said they would die the day that they ate the fruit. They didn't. They lived for another 80-something years, supposedly, according to the Bible. Or how many years? Actually, it may have been like 800 years. I don't know how long they lived to be. But the point is, Satan never told a lie that I could find in the Bible. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Kind of weird, right? Kind of weird that Satan is the exact opposite of the way he's described by God in the Bible. Maybe Satan was the winner of the battle. And had and that's who people have been worshiping the whole time. Who knows? Just throwing it out there. Knock it around the noggin. Hey, Owen. I got a um, philosophical question for you. It's going to sound simple, but trust me here. It's going to be very, very um, thought-provoking. Is morality subjective? Yes. I know, I've thought about this ever since you made the statement that government only protects rights and not reinforces our morality. And I've been thinking about it, and the more I think about it, like... Yeah, let, let me just explain what the caller just said for those who are unfamiliar with the concept. There's this social contract theory kind of thing where the government is not supposed to enforce morality. In fact, it's a bad thing for the government to enforce morality, the government should only be protecting people's rights. No more, no less. So your right to swing your fist ends right here at the tip of my nose. You are perfectly free to swing your fist anywhere else. But if you swing it right here at the tip of my nose, that would be a violation of my rights. So the government protects your right to swing your fist, and they protect my right 
to not be attacked. So police stepping in and preventing you from punching me in the face is not a violation of your rights. It's a protection of mine. The government should have no say past that, basically. That's the whole philosophy behind it. So the government shouldn't legislate morality. They should only protect people's rights. No more, no less. That's the, con- the, that's the idea behind what the caller just said. And I've been thinking about it, and the more I think about it, like all, pe- all different people have different kinds of morality, even if the even if the one of the moralities is wrong in the general society, but we're free to have our own kind of morality. Just wondering, just thinking about it. Thank you. I love what you do. Bye. Yeah, I appreciate it. Morality is most definitely subjective. We can see a perfect example of that at play with Iran. Right now in Iran, there are massive protests happening because a woman was taken by the morality police for not wearing a hijab, and she died in their custody. The morality police arrested this woman for not wearing a hijab. And there's, like, a revolution happening at the moment. They are going absolutely heckin' batty, which I'm so glad about. It's fantastic. But think about that. It's a violation of their morality, which is enforced by law in Iran. To not wear a head covering. Is that... There's nothing objectively moral about that. Christians like to say there is objective morality in the Bible. And if you use the Bible as a moral guide, you can find that objective morality. In reality, that's not true. The Bible espouses so many different moral positions from beginning to end. It's impossible to base your moral system on it. There is a verse to back up any position, anything that you want to believe. It's in there. You can believe absolutely anything and find a Bible verse to support it. Even the flat earth. There are Bible verses to loosely support the flat earth. It's a big book. It's impossible to not cherry pick. So even people who who claim to have a source of objective morality are wrong. They started out with these moral ideas and beliefs and precepts and found verses to back those positions up, those already existing moral beliefs. That's actually how it works. Um, hi, Owen. My name's El Seely. Um, and I say them pronouns, please. Uh, and I'm from Colorado. I'm just curious, what types of schools Um, do Jehovah's Witnesses tend to send their children to? Do they tend to send them to, like, Christian schools or public schools? Um, I ask because it seems like maybe Christian schools would make their children, like, more easily indoctrinated. But if children are supposed to try and spread Jehovah's Witness information to other children, um, maybe those public schools would have a broader environment. So, um, yeah, I was just wondering about that. Love the show. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate the phone call. Uh, The answer is Jehovah's Witnesses view Christian schools as part of Christendom or part of like the the big evil cabal. Jehovah's Witnesses have a concept for the Illuminati too. It's just a different name, I guess. Uh, Christendom or the world. The big evil group of people out there who are trying to take Jehovah's Witnesses down. Kind of ridiculous. But anyway, yeah, they view Christian schools as like the root of all evil, basically and would never, ever send one of their children to a Christian school under any circumstances because they think that they are teaching them incorrectly or whatever else. So the answer is they definitely do send their children to public schools, but they're not really huge fans of public schools in general and what they teach them, so they teach their children various different things and exclude them from certain activities. They exclude them from any celebrations like Christmas or anything, they exclude them from saying the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning. They exclude them from sex ed classes. And if at all possible, depending on how much time the Jehovah's Witness has on their hands, they might even go as far as to homeschool their kids. I was homeschooled, and my friend growing up was homeschooled also. And it was bad. 
It was not good. It's just terrible, man. I am very opposed to homeschooling, deeply opposed to it. Next, we're going to talk about Dog the Bounty Hunter working his way into prophecy among evangelicals. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description. Dog the Bounty Hunter, of all people, has been making a lot of public appearances lately. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this guy, but he's like a TV show bounty hunter who goes around and busts people's door in and takes them to jail for money, blah, blah, blah. That's what he does. And as it turns out, he is far, far right. I mean, God, does it get more right wing than this guy? More Christian nationalist extremist than him? I don't know. This dude is out there. Let me just give you a couple of examples to show you what I mean when I say this guy is deeply, deeply Christian nationalist and absolutely nutter butters. This came out late September 2022. I'm I'm not sure what he was at here. DogCon? I have no idea. I don't know what he was doing. But listen to his uh, little speech here. Wait till November when the Republican Party, I think I met one Christian Democrat. Have you? When the Republican Party... Okay, uh, you know, I, I can't just let that slide. There are tons and tons and tons of Christian Democrats. But, you know, here's the point he's trying to make. You aren't a Christian unless you are part of the Republican Party. You aren't a Christian unless you are a right-wing extremist. You have to be, or God won't save you. That's what it's all about with these people. He's not the only one that's espoused this idea. I'll show you more in a minute, but keep listening here. When the Republican Party wipes them out. So he thinks the Republicans are going to wipe out Democrats in the 2022 midterms. Wait till November. Wait till November. I don't care how many ballot boxes there are. I don't care how they try to cheat. Wait till you see what happens. Okay, first of all, this guy looks like Neelix from Voyager, right? From Star Trek Voyager. Yeah, I just need to type Neelix. I don't even need to type the rest. Let's just look at a picture of Neelix. Tell me that Dog the Bounty Hunter doesn't look exactly like Neelix from the side. Does that look just like Neelix or what? It's a spitting image of Neelix, right? It's Neelix. Is this actually Neelix? Weird. Anyways, you know, if it's possible, I mean, it, midterms haven't happened yet, but it, I guess it's theoretically possible that Republicans will wipe out Democrats in midterms. If they do, is this a prophecy from Dog? As a matter of fact, it is. This guy is telling us that God told him that the Democrats would be wiped out in the midterm elections 2022. So what happens when that doesn't happen, hypothetically? What's his response then? His response is, they cheated. And if he succeeds, if his prophecy does happen to come true, he was right. See how that works? Either the Democrats cheated or they lost. There is no fair election in his mind if he doesn't win. That is the destruction of democracy. This headspace this mindset right here is the destruction of democracy we're watching it happen i told you this morning little hitler and if you'll remember hitler of course little hitler is supposed to be joe biden it's deeply disgusting that he would refer to him as that and i'll get into why in a minute but keep listening hitler committed hitler you know why because he was caught And you know what's going to happen? They're going to catch these cheaters. And I'm not saying with my mouth or my... Right, is he saying that they haven't already caught those cheaters, quote unquote? Um, I think that's kind of funny because that's all Dog's been talking about for like two years now is how Democrats cheated, you know, constant. It's like a nonstop fire hose of it. So when are they going to catch him, Dog? If they never do catch him, are you ever going to admit you were wrong? Of course he won't. 
or my tongue that eaters. And I'm not saying with my mouth or my tongue that he's going to commit. But you never know. So he's not saying with his mouth or his tongue that this is going to happen. But you never know that. First of all, this is not something to be happy or jokey about. Look at the shit eating grin on the guy's face as he talks about this. And second, what else would you say it with but your mouth or tongue? I guess with a pen? I think what he meant when he said that is he's not prophesying it. He's not saying that God told him that this is going to happen, but you never know. Depraved. Disgusting. Celebrating people getting hurt. That is a line I would absolutely never cross. This is a difference between me and the people that I criticize. It's not about political or religious ideologies and the differences between them with me. The people that I criticize are fundamentally are fundamentally different in the sense that they are willing to take pride and happiness and be gleeful over people getting hurt or dying. They encourage it. They use stochastic terrorism to their benefit. They break laws and cheat and lie and manipulate and do whatever it takes to win, to get their side a leg up. I would never do something like that. Never. That is the, that is the fundamental difference. That's really what I'm criticizing. I'm not necessarily criticizing the things that they believe. I'm criticizing their tactics, their their propaganda methods. It's absolutely disgusting behavior. Interestingly enough, he actually tells us why he believes that God is uh, allowed Biden to win the 2020 election. I talked about cognitive dissonance recently. Cognitive dissonance is this anxiety that's induced by your beliefs and reality not matching. So Leon Festinger is a writer and a psychologist who wrote a book back in the 1950s, I think 1954. The name of the book was When Prophecy Fails. The book was about a UFO cult called The Seekers, and they deeply to the bottom of their hearts believed that there's going to be a flood that's going to wipe out all of mankind on, I think, December 21st, 1950-something, or I don't remember exactly now. And they believed that the aliens were going to come pick them up before the flood. And they all had to be together in this one little room before the flood hit so that they could be beamed up to the mothership. When that didn't happen, when they all gathered into a group together waiting for the mothership, and the hour ticks down and passes, what happened? Nothing. There was a cognitive dissonance in their head that they didn't know how to resolve. There was this stress, this anxiety that they had to alleviate in some way. And this book, When Prophecy Fails by Leon Festinger, is where the term cognitive dissonance was coined. He created the term for this book. Now, you can alleviate that anxiety that's induced by the dissonance between or that's induced by the differences between your beliefs and reality, you can alleviate that, that stress a number of ways. One of which is changing your beliefs. That's the most ideal one, obviously, but it's the one that people like Dog the Bounty Hunter almost never take. Another way is to convert as many believers to your side as possible. If you can convince others that you are correct about what you believe, it makes it easier for you to believe it yourself. Another way to alleviate this stress, this anxiety that is cognitive dissonance, is to bend the story around until it fits both your beliefs and your reality. So do whatever it takes to make them merge together seamlessly. If there are a couple of gaps here and there that don't really add up, then that's okay. You just ignore those. That's what cognitive dissonance is, and that's what we witness with these people. You can see the stress play out in front of us. Now, with all that in mind, listen to what he says here, because this clip is about him explaining why, despite the fact that all of these prophets 
prophesied Trump was going to win the 2020 election, why he lost. He's going to explain why Biden is the president, even though in his theology he shouldn't be. So I'm praying, Lord, why have you led us in this way? Why did you let that freak steal the election? Why did you do this? And once I tell you why, you're going to agree with me. The Lord took me to the Bible, and Jesus' disciples came up to him and said, God, Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it the sins of his father and his mother? Before we continue, just step back a little bit. Did you catch what he said there? Listen to this one more time, this one section here. Came up to him and said, Right here. And once I tell you why, you're going to agree with me. If it's true, why is it something people would have to agree with? This is something that could be tested and verified as a real fact. This isn't a, a, a factual claim. This is an opinion claim. And this is him building up a narrative and explanation to alleviate the stress in his mind. That is cognitive dissonance. Trying to come to terms with the fact that the things that he believes and reality don't match up with each other. So he's offering up an explanation to people, hoping that this will alleviate their cognitive dissonance anxiety also. I tell you why you're going to agree with me. The Lord took me to the Bible and Jesus' disciples came up to him and said, God, Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it the sins of his father and his mother that made him blind? And well, I think in some cases, didn't... Am I correct in saying that God actually did curse, like, children for different generations for a while? Eventually, I think that whole idea of cursing generations was removed, like God disapproved of it. But, yeah, I think that's in there. Not for nothing, you know. Blind? And Jesus said, no... That's not why this bad thing happened. The reason this bad thing happened is that to show God's manifestation. Okay, so his explanation, his route to alleviating the stress that is cognitive dissonance is to claim that despite the fact that these prophets foretold and prophesied from God, that Trump is going to win the election. Despite that fact, God allowed Trump to lose, even though he told the prophets he would win, so that people would see God's hand working. Wasn't that the point in the first place? Wasn't God telling the prophets that Trump is going to win in the first place because he wanted to show that he was real or show his manifestation of his power or whatever. And aside from that, why would he do that in the first place? Doesn't the Bible say, don't put the Lord your God to the test or something like that? Doesn't it specifically say, don't test God? Is this not a test? See, in the process of creating this or bending his beliefs around reality to make it fit just right, like a piece of clay he's forming around a ball, in his attempt to do so, it's leaving more holes. It's leaving more, uh, it's just blowing giant holes in the plot. N nothing is coming together cohesively because he's changing the ideas for everything. But it doesn't matter. You know what matters? His cognitive dissonance on this one issue is alleviated. And if he doesn't look too closely, at every other issue in the Bible, if he doesn't, if he chooses not to read the verse about not putting God to the test or whatever else, he won't have to deal with the cognitive dissonance anymore. He won't have to deal with that stress. That's what we're watching play out right now. And he's got a shit-eating grin like he just one-upped the Democrats or whatever. There's nothing we could have done about it. Not at all. Yeah, he stole it because now, little Hitler, we are going to show you God's manifestation. We're going to get to the little Hitler comments that he keeps making in a minute, probably at the end of this video. I'm going to address that because there's some relevant stuff in there to talk about. But check out this next clip. This one's from late July 2022. This is another example 
of Dog the Bounty Hunter going on Flashpoint, this TV show that's run, uh, owned and operated by Kenneth Copeland. It's like this ultra-religious far-right TV show on the Victory Network, a far-right ultra-religious network. This is Dog the Bounty Hunter's appearance on there. Listen to this. I'm known by taking the guy, slapping him up a little bit, he seems to be proud of that. I don't know who would be proud of slapping somebody up. It's disgusting. Giving him a cigarette and putting Jesus down his throat. Again, why would you be proud of this? You know, I, look, this, neither here nor there, but I do just want to point out there are a disproportionate number of Christians in jail right now. Atheist prison population makes up 0.07% of inmates when the general population is 6% atheist. So 6% versus 0.07%. Not 0.7%, 0.07%. That's how small it is. Christian prison population. Hang on, I'm just looking here. This is 538. They're pretty reputable. Wow, Jehovah's Witnesses make up 0.7% of the prison population. I'm surprised. That's more than atheists, like by a lot. Okay, I can't really find just a flat Christian number. We've got it's split into Protestant, Catholic, Muslim, Native American, Pagan, Jewish, Buddhist, Seventh day Adventist, Mormon, Eastern Orthodox, and a lot of these are Christian denominations. So 28.7% are Protestant, 24% are Catholic, just trying to hit the Christian denominations. 1.5% are Church of Christ, 0.7% Jehovah's Witness, 0.3% Seventh day Adventist, 0.3% is Mormon. Point two is Eastern Orthodox. Those are the main ones. Yeah, that's the prison population. We're looking at a grossly high percentage of Christians in prison versus atheists in prison. I'm just saying, if you are capturing bad guys, quote unquote, maybe the last thing you want to do is shove Jesus down their throat. Maybe that's what got him into this mess in the first place. Now, that's not fair. That's not fair. Uh, Christianity and the prison population are correlated, but correlation is not causation. So Christianity is not causing people to go to jail. I just want to put that on record. That was unfair of me to, to even say. But anyways, keep listening. I, I got off on a little tangent there, but yeah, just keep, keep listening to what he says. It's called the backseat ride. No, I do not come to bring peace, but a sword. Mothers shall turn against daughters, daughters against fathers, and this is war. You know, there is that verse in the Bible. That's that's fair enough. That's true. It is in there. There are also verses in there that talk about loving your neighbor as yourself, not judging lest ye be judged, all this other stuff that related to Jesus being peaceful and loving and not hating anybody for anything. That verse is in there, though, and I think it's interesting to point out the fact that he picked the violent, hateful verse to go with when he could have chosen to pick the happy-go-lucky, loving verse to go with. The Bible is not a moral guide for anybody. It is impossible to use the Bible as a moral guide. The Bible is only a reflection of your own morals. It can't possibly be more than that because it contradicts itself every other verse. If you have a moral or spiritual or, or whatever belief on any subject, you can find a Bible verse to defend it, and he just found one to defend his extremism. It is no longer Republicans against Democrats. That's right. That's right. It's Christians against evil. <laughs> now that is disturbing. That is a disturbing trend that I have found running through Christianity very recently, and I feel compelled to talk about it. I'm going to talk about that in just a second and why that's so disturbing, but before we get there, I do just want to point out that this guy, Dog the Bounty Hunter, has effectively become a part of prophecy among the, the religious right. This is Hank Kuhneman. He's a supposed prophet of God. He's one of the prophets who claimed that God told him that Donald Trump was going to win the 2020 election. And when he didn't, 
of course. He claimed that it was stolen and that, you know, he really won and blah, 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 all the other stuff that they say. I mean, he's, he's one of those people. So listen to what he says about Dog the Bounty Hunter and his role in prophecy. God is not going to ignore what happened in 2020, November 3rd of our election. The end- uh, by the way, this is happening late March 2021 when Hank Kuhneman says that this is like over a year. This is a year and a half after the election ended, basically over a year after Biden had been inaugurated and they're stuck on it. In 2020, November 3rd of our election, the enemy wants it to go away. The media wants it to go away. The, the, those that are in the circus house wants it to go away. But God is not going to rest. Now, why is dog here tonight? Because I believe there's a spiritual bounty by the hand of God that is over those that have done injustice. They've done it to the children. Dog the bounty hunter appears on the Flashpoint program, and Hank Kuhneman uses that as a pretext to claim that there's a spiritual bounty on who? They've done it to the children. They've done it in the earth. I guess on his political enemies, and he's just blaming everybody for this. This is insane. They've done it concerning our government, our politics. This is just nuts, dude. These people are not in reality with the rest of us. Okay, now, a a minute ago, I told you I was going to talk about why it's so deeply concerning to hear this become a standard talking point in the Republican Party. And this is war. It is no longer Republicans against Democrats. It's Christians against evil. Let me tell you why it's so deeply concerning to hear things like that from so many people. He's by no means the only one I've heard it from. Greg Locke said it not too long ago. Mike Lindell's been saying it for like ever. People have been saying that Roger Stone said it not too long ago. And I have these clips that I might insert in a little bit, depending on how long this video is. But let me show you why it's so concerning that people are saying this stuff, that that people like Dog the Bounty Hunter and others are saying this. This is a video from 1942 called Don't Be a Sucker. It was created as a method of preventing Americans from falling into the same trap that the Nazis fell into in the 1930s and the 1940s. And you'll see what I mean in just a second. Listen to just the opening part here. They can live together and work together and build America together because they're free. Free to vote, to say what they please, go to their own churches, to pick their own jobs. Yeah, Mike's got something, all right. He's got America. But there are guys who stay up nights figuring out how to take that away from him. I want to give you the truth, folks. The truth about America. Now listen to this guy and tell me if it sounds familiar to you. I know you've got a lot of questions. You want to know why you're not getting the breaks you deserve? Well, I'm not a politician, but I've made it my business to study these things, and I happen to know the facts. My friends, I'm just an average American, but I'm an American-American, and some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see people with foreign accents making all the money. I see Negroes holding jobs that belong to me and you. Does any of this sound familiar? Seriously. Have you heard anything recently about immigrants taking our jobs and all that other stuff? Now I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? I've heard this kind of talk before, but I never expected to hear it in America. This fellow seems to know what he's talking about. Yes, he knows our rights. What's the answer? What are we real Americans going to do about it? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Negroes and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Now, friends, these books are free. Paid for by real Americans who want others to know the truth. Excuse me, young man, but are you actually going to read that stuff? Sure, why not? You heard what he said. Yes, I heard. But do you believe in that kind of talk? I don't know. It makes pretty good sense to me. I'm speaking to you as an American-American. See, when people 
divide you up and give you somebody to blame for all of your problems and tell you that you're a king and you should be treated as such. And the only reason that you're not is because of this group over here. It suckers people in. That's why the name of this video is Don't Be a Sucker. This was the strategy of the Nazi party back in the 30s in Germany. This is what they did. They divided people up into categories, into groups, and said, these people are to blame, and those people are to blame, and those people shouldn't exist at all, and if you're a member of this group, the master race, Aryans in Germany, uh, in America it would be Christian nationalists, then you deserve everything, and if you don't have it, then it's everyone else's fault. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without Negroes, without alien foreigners, without Catholics, without Freemasons. You know these What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? These are your enemies. These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them. You know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Thank you. See, one guy was clapping at the end because everybody else in that group probably fell into one of those categories that he listed, a Freemason or a Catholic or whatever else. I think that's the point the video is trying to make. Before he said Masons, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about... What about those other people? But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people, all of us. What about you? You aren't American, are you? I was born in Hungary, but now I am an American citizen. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. You know, there's some strong language in this, but I feel like it's important to play it anyways. I feel like this is such a deeply valuable video to listen to, just, at least just parts of it. Honestly, it's like 30 minutes long, can't watch the whole thing today, but it is a deeply valuable and important message that everybody should see, every single person in America, in my opinion. Like I said, don't be a sucker is the name of it. We're going to watch just a couple more minutes of it, but you should look it up on your own time if you want and just see what it's all about. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. You, you notice what he said there? They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple a nation? That's more true than people realize. Hatred and racism are not something that people are born with. This is a point they make later in the video too. I don't know if we'll get to it or not, but hatred and racism and prejudice are taught. They are not innate parts of human nature. Now you may favor one tribe or another tribe, you know, you may prefer to go with this group or that group or whatever. That's not the same as hatred, bigotry, and racism. They're very different. Hatred, bigotry, racism, sexism, those are all taught. If you have some part of your brain that, that feels that way or felt that way at some point, it's because it was taught to you. That's not a, a normal feeling that people should have, racism or hatred toward others. Of course, that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, we human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us, made by someone who wants something. That is a scientific fact, what he just said. We are not born with prejudices. They're made for us, made by somebody who wants something. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk, somebody is going to get something out of it, and it isn't going to be you. This is not classroom theory. I saw it happen. I saw it first in Berlin in 1932. 
Now, this is where it really relates back to Dog the Bounty Hunter. Remember what he said earlier? This is war. This isn't a battle between Republicans and Democrats. It's a war between good and evil, us and them. Five young men that I knew were standing in the crowd listening to the Nazi speaker. Eric was a Catholic. Anton, a student of mine, was a Jew. Heinrich owned a small hardware store. Carl was a farmer. And Hans was an unemployed metal worker. To all true Aryan Germans, I say it is time you inherited the nation which rightfully belongs to you. To you alone belongs the glorious destiny of the greater Germany. The Nazi party will provide land for the farmer, work for the worker, and profits for the small businessman. Who is getting these things now? The Jew. I mean, this is a little bit on the nose and a little obvious. Now, I, this is actually exactly how it played out in Nazi Germany, but it's a little bit obvious for us um, in today's political climate. They're usually a little more veiled about the message, but this is exactly how it starts. This is exactly what's happening right now. Do you remember all that stuff back in 2016, Donald Trump blaming immigrants. They said they're not sending their best. They're sending drugs. They're sending crime. They're blank. I mean, you guys remember these messages, right? We've been hearing this stuff from the Republican Party for years, for years. It sounds exactly like what this Nazi is saying in this old 1942 video. The Jew who has stolen our nation and our birthright. Who makes all the money and takes all our jobs? The Jew! He must be shunned. He must be ostracized. He must be eliminated. And the Catholics. We don't want our great nation run by a foreign church. We Germans will know what to do with these people when the time comes. They and their faith must be destroyed. Then there are the Freemasons. In Germany, we have no place for secret societies. I'm just going to skip forward a little bit because there's one more part that I really want to hit on. Listen to what he says here. Each minority, and he split them off one from the other. These men were all fellow Germans when they came here today. Now they were split into rival groups, suspicious of each other, hating each other. They were being swindled, all of them. But the man who was really being fooled was Hans. He was pure German, according to Nazi standards. To him, they promised everything, and he fell for it. I can't play the whole thing in this clip, but if you want to see a, a longer breakdown, it releases on my channel. You know, it may already have released on my main channel. Just Owen Morgan, parentheses, telltale. If you want to see the whole thing, you can watch the breakdown there. But the point is, what Dog the Bounty Hunter is saying and doing here is exactly how the Nazi party split people into groups and destroyed them. That is not hyperbole. That is not me being nervous over nothing. This is like we can watch history unfold in front of us. This is real shit. That's right. It's Christians against evil. Instead of the Aryan race being the master race, it's now Christians. And not just Christians, but these people's very specific denomination of Christianity. This evangelical denomination. That's what we're dealing with now. This is the new Nazi party. And I say that without a lick of irony or hyperbole. We should be concerned. If you disagree with anything I've said, let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Telltale Atheist. I'm watching Don't Be a Sucker right now, made in 1947. It's amazing how well it's aged. Great message. Can't believe it was made 80 years ago. I appreciate that. Yeah, I thought it was 1942. It said in the description that it was a series of lessons from uh, produced from 1942 to 1947. So maybe it is 1947. Unsure. If it is, I'll find out and I'll insert that in the final clip but anyway yeah it, it's fantastic your long lost pal it's straight up dehumanization of the political opposition those against us are irredeemably evil comparable to adolf h yeah absolutely yep it is 
disturbing on entirely new levels. I am blown away by the fact that they don't see the comparisons. That's probably because a lot of the people who were around to see the rise of the Nazi party are gone. You know, they, they've aged out now and they're not around to explain that this what's happening around us right now has happened once before. There's a meme that, you know, left wingers call everybody Nazis. Everyone's a Nazi, blah, blah, blah. I'm 100 percent comfortable calling certain people Nazis if that's what it looks like, if that's what it is. I don't care if you are in support of Hitler or not, but what you're doing is exactly what the Nazi party did back in the 30s to dehumanize and hate and spread bigotry and destroy. It's the same thing, exact same thing. Next, we're gonna talk about some of the bizarre stuff supposed prophet of God Julie Green has said about Donald Trump and others. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description. This is Julie Green. If you're unfamiliar, she claims to be a prophet of God, and she says some absolutely off-the-wall stuff. She's the official campaign prophet of the Doug Mastriano campaign, gubernatorial campaign for governor of Pennsylvania, and oh my God. God, has she said some wacky stuff. Just listen to this one clip, mid-August 2022. This is the clip that really put her on my radar. Check this out. They know Nancy can't handle the presidency. No. They know she's a drunk. But they know she is dying. And they helped with that. Who is they, I hear you asking. And the answer is the cabal. That's right. Julie Green is a QAnoner. Deep deep qanon -er. They are now disposing of anyone they feel is no longer useful to them. I love that, Kate. Useful to them. I, I love it, dude. I love how she phrases things. It's great. Her days are coming to an end, and she will not last until the 2020 midterm elections. Wow, that's awfully specific. So again, if you remember, she's a prophet of God. The information that she's giving us right now, let me tell you how she sets this up. I actually watched one of her prophecy videos on the 27th of September on my main channel. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. But here's basically how she sets her whole thing up. She writes down things she believes came from God, right? Or types it up on her keyboard, and then she reads it out like it's a Bible verse that she's reading. Good. Let me show you just a simple example. Look, she's staring down at a screen, right? You are right on the precipice of it all changing. My church, get ready now. See, she's reading it like it's a Bible verse. Don't wait another day. There's an urgency in these words to be ready for what is coming. Except... It's not a normal Bible verse like you'd expect. It's QAnon nonsense, like what we're about to hear. She'll be visited by the angel of death for her crimes against my nation. This is Nancy Pelosi again. And the blood is dripping from her hands. She loves to drink the little children's blood. That's crazy. That is crazy. What is going through this woman's head? Oh, my God. By drinking this blood, they believe they will receive a longer life. Yes, a true witch. She really is. Actually, she's Catholic. Uh, that's neither here nor there. So anyways, this is this is Julie Green, man. She is out there way out there. Well, she gave us a new prophetic declaration recently that is, believe it or not, just as out there as the other stuff we just listened to. Late September 2022, when she laid this down for us. Check this out. They hate the children because they are Luciferians, they're Baal worshippers, oh, yes. and that's why they sacrifice children for Baal. Who is they? Are they in the room with us right now? Who are you talking about? This is called weasel words, 
And what she's doing is basically referring to an ambiguous, amorphous authority that's out there, some secret group that's trying to take you out and hurt you and whatever else. She builds up this whole insane narrative in her head about who these people are and then continues to pump out propaganda and nonsense about them trying to kill Nancy Pelosi and all this crazy unhinged stuff, dude. And, and they're bail worshippers and they're Luciferians and they're trying to take kids and oh my God. Yeah. This is nothing new. You can see that in the, in the Bible. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you can see that in the Bible. It so it, it may have been, it may have slipped right past you because they said it real quietly, but she she's now mentioned Baal and Moloch, both, which are both gods from the Canaanite pantheon. You may be familiar with the Canaanites from the Bible. The Canaanites were a group of people who lived beside the Jews or near the Jews in the same area around Bible times. And they had their own set of gods that they believed in, just like the Greeks had their set of gods, you know, and, and the Romans, you know, Zeus and Neptune and Poseidon and all of them, Hermes and whatever else. The Canaanites had their own set of gods, too. First and foremost, they had the god who created all other gods. His name was El. And the first 12 gods that he created were known as the Elohim. One of the gods he created was the god of metallurgy, and he went by the name of Yahweh. Of course, the Jews came along and saw that and said, I like that. I'm going to take it. So they took Yahweh as their main man that was going to take care of them. And that's why in the Ten Commandments, there was that whole bit about not worshiping any other gods but him. Remember, he's a jealous god. He doesn't want you worshiping others. There were no other gods, supposedly, but in reality, they were pulling from the Canaanite pantheon, and they reference in the Bible Baal and Marduk and a bunch of others. That's why they're talking about Baal and Marduk and, and all of the others now because they're referencing the Canaanite pantheon, whether they realize it or not. Satan didn't exist in the Old Testament. The old Jews didn't have a Satan. That wasn't until way, way, way later. So Julie Green and others refer to Marduk and Baal, which are supposed to be the bad guy gods from the Canaanite pantheon. So anyway, keep listening. You can see that in the Bible. It was He was there. And the Luciferians, they, they literally is they say they satanic rituals. And that's the reason why God wants to expose and destroy Washington, D.C. Because that land was, giving, was given over to Lucifer. And that's the reason why D.C. is where it is. That was never God's capital. He mentions it more than once. He doesn't want it there. He wants it moved. He wants it destroyed. Wow. God wants... Okay, if you have been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that these people believe that God is in covenant with the United States the same way that God was in covenant with Israel. Now they call America New Israel. I know I've played this like three or four times already. I just want to give a little bit of context. This is Shane Vaughn, and he really forms out the theology for the most part for the, the Trump religion, which is largely what this is it's a trump religion now listen to him explain new israel and the covenant with yahweh and he wrote down wow. we are going he wrote a course to new israel new israel new israel talking about the founding fathers floating over here on the ships and when they came off the ship they didn't plant an american flag they planted the christian flag mm -hmm. on the soil they dedicated george washington knelt and prayed dedicated america where the twin towers stand or stood that's where america came into covenant with yahweh with god was where the twin towers stand wow. So anyway, I'm not going to go into that too far, but the point is these people genuinely believe that the United States is the new Israel, and they go a step further than that by calling Donald Trump the son of man, the Christ, the Messiah of new Israel. This is the, a real cover of a real book by Helgard Muller. That's what these people believe, no joke. And I guess they think that D.C. is supposed, like the, the seat of government for the United States is supposed to be changed to some other location. Where? Mar-a-Lago, maybe? I don't know where she thinks it should be changed to. So anyways, Julie Green went on this long, emotional talk to Donald Trump. She spoke to him as though she was saying a prayer. Now, she doesn't frame it like it's prayer or anything. That's just my framing, so take that for what you will. But 
She's receiving divine information from God that she is handing to Donald Trump in this. This is from August 3rd, 2022. Listen to this. Donald Trump, my son, do not doubt me and do not doubt what I will do for you. I'll protect whom you love and I'll protect this nation from what you are being told is possible and it could be the worst case scenarios. This will not happen. I will not allow your enemies to go that far. I know it's hard to imagine less casualties. She's literally crying, literally crying over how much she loves Donald Trump. The level of brainwashing at work here is absolutely astounding. It's hard to imagine less casualties in a situation like this. But I have done this in my word before. My son go to Second Chronicles 20 in my written word and read what I did for my people. The enemies fought each other and none on my side were lost. This is possible. Get in prayer with me. Surround yourselves with people who can pray with authority, who will lead you in the right direction. Donald, you have had people surrounding you who have purposely given you bad advice. You see, and this is their explanation for what happens or why Donald Trump does things that they don't want him to do. In their heads, he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's, he's perfect in everything. He knows all the right things to do. He makes all the right decisions. So it can't be him making mistakes. It must be his advisors. It must be the people around him. And if they can just get a message to him, then he, they know he would correct course. Do they afford that same grace to Joe Biden? You know, maybe he's a good guy. Maybe it's just he's getting bad information. Maybe he thinks that this is the right thing to do for the economy because that's what he was told. But if we just get a message to him that, you know, it's not the right thing, he would change it. He would do something different. They don't give him that. They hate Joe Biden. Literally view him as though he were Satan. It's a perfect example of what I'm talking about right here. Televangelist Robin Bullock. Uh, when this fake inauguration took place, the Lord spoke to me a word and said, now the office of the president has been vacated and there's a jackal sitting in the seat of the president. See, they believe him to be a jackal. They believe that he overturned prophecy. There's another example. Listen to this. Robin Bullock, televangelist. The ground, this so-called administration, is actually a regime whose sole purpose is to stop a prophecy from coming to pass. So the whole bit here is they don't think to themselves well maybe joe biden just got wrapped up in this you know maybe it was just a mistake and he was just like but he has the power he's the president now so maybe he could turn around and fix things to be what i want him to if we just got a message to him no that's not that is the grace that they afford to trump it's not what they do for biden why because trump is on their side and biden is the devil that's basically how they view him. Effectively, Satan. Setting out to overturn a prophecy. He's a jackal. That isn't just, I don't like the guy. The language that, that Bullock and Shane Vaughn and Hank Kuhneman and, and Kenneth Copeland and all the people that I talk about, even Julie Green, the language they use when referring to Trump is prophetic and messianic. And the language they use referring to Biden is evil, Luciferian. He's a jackal. So let's... Keep listening to what Julie Green here has to say, the, the message she wants to deliver from God to Trump, as if God couldn't deliver the message himself. I have had people surrounding you who have purposely given you bad advice. Some know they are sent there to sabotage you. I will reveal the ones who are left. I Still crying, by the way. We're, I think we're like, we're like at least two minutes into this clip from her and she's crying still. I will tell you who to have near you during this time. My son, it's go time. So go and I will be with you. I will be with this nation. You are a part 
of the new United States. The new United States. Remember the clip I played earlier about the U.S. being in covenant with Yahweh and all that? I have called you here for this moment. I promise you, my son, I will not fail you. And I will not fail this nation. So this is supposed to be coming from God. She is telling Donald Trump from God that God is saying... He will not fail Donald Trump or the nation. It's weird that she even thinks that that's something God would say. I will not fail you, Donald Trump. Is that weird to anybody else? It feels blasphemous, honestly. I love you beyond what you could have imagined. Everything stolen, everything lost, you are about to get back in multiplication. My son, beyond your wildest dreams, I will restore and give back more. I will shield your family and no one will touch them. I have my angel army surrounding you. Wow, so this came out August 3rd, I think, right? Yeah, August 3rd. This was five days before Mar-a-Lago was searched by the FBI. And did you hear what she just said? I will shield your family and no one will touch them. Ooh, ouch. Wow. That's five days before they searched Baron Trump's bedroom for classified documents. I love it. I absolutely love it. I mean, I don't like the FBI being forced into a position by Donald Trump that they even needed to search a kid's room. But, you know, if Donald Trump hadn't stolen classified documents in the first place, then they wouldn't have had to have done something like that. That's neither here nor there. Uh, Donald Trump made every part of this happen, but it feels to me like this prophecy was proven wrong five days later. Um, I have my angel army surrounding you and your family in this time. And how'd that go? How'd that work out for old Mr. Trump five days later? That go okay for him? So go and do what I have called you to do and I will be with you my son thank you for your sacrifice and thank you for your obedience thank you for trusting me in spite despite what you have seen and what your enemies have tried to do to break you I will break them and all their plans this is that time I will give you peace and rest you have never known when you sleep I will come to you and tell you what to do. Wait, God's going to come to Donald Trump in his sleep and tell him what to do? Then why does he need you, right? Aren't you supposed to be the communicator for God? Does that mean that Donald Trump is a prophet now? This is weird. I am here, and I will always be here for you, my son. Say the Lord of hosts. Oh my God, this is weird. This this woman has problems that the most skilled therapist on planet Earth couldn't solve. This is insane. So she puts out another prophetic whatever the other day, right? September 21st. And she had some wacky stuff to say then too. Pretty much every prophetic word she releases is wacky as they come. And as a matter of fact, if you want to see the whole prophetic word, I'm going to be talking about it on my main channel on Tuesday, September 27th. So come check it out. I'm just going to give you a couple of snippets at this moment. Listen to what she had to say here. Moves are being made. Oh yes, an army is marching towards your capital to take this nation. They have all been caught red-handed, even the big fish. An army is marching toward the capital as we speak, she says. How long does it take for an army to reach the capital? Where are they coming from? How big is the army? How are they being supplied? How have we not detected the army? I mean, we've got people all over the place just driving around all willy-nilly. How have they managed to mobilize and move across large distances in presumably military gear, tanks and Humvees and all that, without being detected? Did she mean figuratively? Why say it in the first place if that's what she meant? It seems to me she obviously meant a literal army is traveling across the nation to D.C. And if you think that's a little far-fetched, you haven't watched the last 
20 minutes of this video that I've been doing. Oh yes, an army is marching toward your capital to take this nation. They have all been caught red-handed, even the big fish. So everybody who supposedly in her head cheated in the election has been caught red-handed and an army is marching across the country to Washington, D.C. to kick Biden out of the White House right now is what she's saying. This is September 21st when this came out, 2022. They have been waiting for every piece needed to gather evidence for every person involved for the destru of the destruction of this nation has been completed. They have it all. All the right people that I have put there, put here, will expose all the infiltrators and they are moving in to move to make more arrests in order okay i don't know what these subtitles are all about but they're wrong it says to make more rice what i don't know who wrote these but it wasn't me make more arrests in order to hand out all the indictments and to serve justice to those who unlawfully took over this nation okay wow that's a lot so She's saying all of the people who took part in Biden's inauguration and election and everything else are going to be arrested. And there is currently actively right now an army moving on Washington, D.C. to arrest Joe Biden, to take him into custody and replace him with Donald Trump. That's what she just said, right? And she's a prophet of God, the official campaign prophet of the Doug Mastriano campaign in Pennsylvania. You know what the Bible says about false prophets, right? Watch, O United States, how I, the Lord, am delivering you from the hands of the wicked and from the Biden. And from the Biden. I'm watching. I'm watching. I got my eyes peeled. I'm sitting here watching intently. Let's see it. Make it happen. Do it. And Obama at the helm. The truth and all the proof is coming. Fantastic. When it's produced, I will believe you. Simple as that. That is all I need. That's all I've ever needed. But guess what? We're almost two years out now, and I'm still waiting for the proof. When are you going to produce it? Every day that we sit here waiting for the proof, they laugh at us for not believing them. Let's have it. It's coming quickly. Great. Here's another one. Here's just one little excerpt from this same thing, September 21st. Another Clinton secret and scandals are about to be exposed and it will explode in the airwaves. A whistleblower is coming and this will not be held back, suppressed or ignored. Okay, cool. So a whistleblower is going to come forward that's going to blow the lid off of everything related to the Clintons, right? Why are we even still talking about the Clintons? They aren't involved in politics. And it won't be suppressed or ignored when it comes. Awesome. That's what I need. Proof. In two months, if this doesn't happen, can we call you a false prophet then? This is the trick. She never actually gives us a timeline. They never do. None of these supposed prophets give us timelines. Or if they do, they when the time comes and then goes, they just extend it out and say, I misheard my mistake. Or God didn't actually tell me a timeline in the first place, even though they already named one specifically. This is how it works every single time. At the beginning of this video, she made a claim that Nancy Pelosi is going to die before the midterm elections of 2022. Now, that's, that's a specific timeline, right? If it doesn't happen... Can we call her a false prophet? We could have called her a false prophet a long time ago, comfortably, for all the stuff she's prophesied that didn't come true. But for some reason, people still follow her, not least of which is Doug Mastriano, of all people. Absolutely insane, man. When are people going to wake up to this nonsense? Blows my mind that anybody believes what she has to say. If you disagree with anything I've said in this video, let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Telltale Atheist. In fact, let me know if you agreed. Next, we're going to talk about Pastor Mark Burns and his unhealthy obsession with Kenneth Copeland. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description.
This is Mark Burns. If you're unfamiliar, he's a televangelist and he's a member of something called the Seven Mountains Mandate or Seven Mountains Dominionism. Now we're gonna get into what that is in a second, but let me just reintroduce you to him if you're unfamiliar. He had some things to say about the LGBT community recently that were deeply, deeply disturbing. This is during Pride Month, early June 2022, when he said this. Check it out. The LGBT transgender grooming our children's minds is a national security threat because it is ultimately designed to destabilize the republic we call the United States of America. That's why when I'm elected, I don't want to just vote. I want to start holding people accountable for treason to the Constitution. I am going to push to reenact HUAC. Okay, so let's just review what he said up to this point. He believes that being gay or being a member of the LGBT community in any way is tantamount to treason against the U.S. government. And he wants to set up or reset up HUAC, the House of Un-American Activities Committee. We'll get to that in a second. Keep listening. HUAC is the House of Un-American Activities Committee. It was a real committee that was formulated back in the 50s and is a, a committee that we should reenact that starts holding these people accountable for treason. We need to hold people for treason, start having some public hearings and start executing people who are found guilty for their treasonous acts against the Constitution of the United States of America, just like they did back in 1776. So this guy just expressed an interest in charging and sentencing members of the LGBT community with treason and giving them the death penalty. That's insane. That is absolutely insane. He is not a nobody. That's what makes this even more disturbing. So what is HUAC? He talks about HUAC an awful lot. Back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, give or take, somewhere in there, there was a house committee in the House of Representatives in Congress called the House of Un-American Activities Committee, and it was responsible for making sure that people weren't doing something that was quote-unquote un-American, which primarily involved being communist. If you were a communist or people thought that you were communist or thought you might have communist leanings or sympathies, they would take you and charge you with a crime or they would do all kinds of crazy messed up stuff, extrajudicial evil stuff. This is actually a video that I have pulled up here of some prisoners of war in China. Now, there's a book called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. It was written by Robert J. Lifton. The reason he wrote the book was because of this video. The people People in this video were, you know, red, white, and blue running through the veins, diehard Americans. They were American-born, American-bred, red, white, and blue loving people, right? Said the Pledge of Allegiance every morning in school. And then they go and fight in, I think, the Korean War. They get captured by the Chinese, and the Chinese brainwash them, and they come out on film, and then they say this. My name is Harold Webb from West Palm Beach, Florida. My name is Aaron Wilson from Urania, Louisiana. This is a very happy moment for me, for now I am free. Free from McCarthyism. McCarthyism. McCarthyism was part of what the House of Un-American Activities Committee was doing. That was McCarthyism. That was the Red Scare. Friends, the only way to stop fascism in America is to do as I have done. Stand up and fight for our rights. My name is Louis Griggs and my home is at Jacksonville, Texas. I stayed behind to escape the Red Bait and McCarthy and are sure that I'll never again have to fight in another unjust war as I did in Korea. Even if I had won in repatriation, the fates of Dickinson and Bachelor would have stopped me. My name is Richard Tennyson. I live in Alden, Minnesota. People who hate war and stand up for their beliefs are faced with McCarthy and fascist cut control House Un-American Activities Committee. You catch that? House of Un-American Activities Committee? I will return someday. When I can speak for peace, lawfully. See, this is how the brainwashing worked. Generally, it just in a nutshell. Like I said, he wrote a whole book about it, so it's very, very complicated, but i try to condense it down. They would take these people and put them in prison camps, and they would treat them really, really well. They wouldn't treat them like garbage, but they were only allowed certain things. They were, they were only allowed... You know, three meals a day plus a bed 
and they were allowed a blanket and a pillow and, and stuff like that, and they were generally not mistreated by other people, by the prison guards. They were not mistreated by the prison guards. Every now and then, they would be offered something small. They'd take them into a room and they'd say, I'll tell you what, write two essays. Write one essay about the good things about China and an essay about one single bad thing about America. It doesn't even have to be that bad. Just pick one good thing about us, one bad thing about them, and we'll give you five cigarettes or we'll give you an extra pillow or whatever. Little concessions, tiny concessions is all it took. And before you know it, they would find that their essay was posted up, you know, on a billboard in the rec room or something. And everybody else saw their friend, their comrade in arms or whatever, saying good things about China, bad things about America. And it would crack, it would chisel away just a little bit more, a little at a time at that patriotism that they had for America until finally, eventually, they fully broke and recognized that there were bad things about America and there were good things about China. And then they'd start pushing them even further in both of those directions. Now, this is obviously a product of brainwashing, what we just saw. Why would somebody who grew up in Louisiana, a, a prisoner of war taken by the Chinese, refuse to go back home? That's crazy, right? This was... This is most definitely brainwashing, and it was not based in reality. However, the crack in the armor that the Chinese used, the thing that these people kept citing as the negative thing that they didn't like about America, that one negative thing, was McCarthyism, the House of Un-American Activities Committee, the fact that they would jail you for saying certain things very obviously against the Constitution, and they were doing it anyways. They used that as a seed to grow in, in an entire orchard to build out this whole brainwashing thing. That's what the Chinese did. The House of Un-American Activities Committee, what Pastor Mark Burns was talking about here, was a blight on American society. It was an evil perpetrated by the American government. And the fact that he wants to bring it back, it, it was true fascism, full-blown, real fascism that was happening. And the fact that he wants to bring it back should disqualify him as a political candidate. Oh yeah, he's a political candidate. Did I forget to mention? He did lose his election recently, his primary, so there's that. But either way, he should be barred from being a politician, period, with some of the things that he's said already. Like, he wants to execute gay people, for example. He wants to bring back fascism. He likes fascism. It, it's absolutely insane. It's like these people don't have any idea of what happened in our past. They want to bring it back. It's nuts. Here's another clip from Mark Burns. This is mid-November 2021. I just really want to form out this idea of who this guy is so you have a full-fleshed idea of it. Listen to what he says here. I'm excited about the growing movement, especially here in the 4th District of South Carolina, of uh, people who are identifying themselves as just Christian conservatives, right? We got to take it back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe the people here in the 4th District of South Carolina are getting that yeah, see, he was running in the 4th District of South Carolina as a Republican. He did lose to a, he did lose his primary, but either way, it, it's just disturbing that he's running at all. Are getting that it's not just about being Republicans, it's about being a conservative Christian who believes this is a Christian nation and any policy that is contrary to the word of God, we need to remove it from uh, from mainstream America and make it illegal remove any policy, any law that is in conflict with the Bible. Remove it from existence and, and make it illegal, I guess. Wow. Well, I have to tell you, the first thing you're going to have to remove is the First Amendment because the First Amendment contradicts the First Commandment. The First Amendment says you have freedom of speech and government and religion shall remain separate. Government will be completely neutral. And the First Commandment says... The people shall have no other gods before Yahweh, basically. So which is it? Which one are we going to go with? Mark Burns wants to erase the Constitution and replace it with the Bible. Now, I know what you're saying. Oh, and that's a little bit of a leap from what he just said, isn't it? I'm not basing what I just said on his position that he just espoused here. I'm basing that on what he has specifically said said there's something called seven mountains dominionism okay listen to what he has to say about seven mountains dominionism and then i'll explain what it is we're taking over all seven mountains for the body yeah, of jesus christ that includes 
information technology right. that includes as what you all are doing here yep. at KCM television, right? Yeah. Because the, you know, we, we, all we got is CNN and MSNBC and. So what he said there may not fully make sense unless you have the context. The Seven Mountains Mandate or Seven Mountains Dominionism is the position that these people want to replace the Constitution with the Ten Commandments. And the plan to make that happen is to get their people at the top of seven different areas of life, what they call the Seven Mountains. They want to get their pastors at the top of every single church in America. Go, send their pastors in, send their people in, work up through the ranks until you reach the top, until you can take the churches over. Go into the Methodist, what do you call it, the Methodist conference or whatever, and run in their elections until you take over their board. So take over religion, take over family, take over media, take over the economy, take over the military, the, that's five, take over the educational system through school boards and things like that, and then take over art. So get people at the top of those seven areas of society in the United States. Get your Christians at the top so that they can dictate how they're going to operate, so that they can turn them into Christian institutions, basically. That's the Seven Mountains mandate. And by doing so, you won't have to worry about converting everybody in the country. You can simply control everybody in the country and force them to be Christians. You don't need to convert them. You can force them. That's the Seven Mountains mandate. And dominionism more generally is replacing the Constitution with the Bible. That's what Mark Burns is all about. That's what he talks about. That's what he was just referring to at the beginning of this a second ago. We're taking over all seven mountains for the body yeah. of Jesus. See, that's what this is all about. And that this guy is not a nobody either. I think he's famously known as the Trump pastor or something like that. Listen to this story he tells about meeting Kenneth Copeland mid-September 2022. By the way, these are brand new clips that I'm playing you right now. Just came out the other day. Back in 2015, um, uh, the guy was thinking about running for president. And so because of my TV network, he wanted to connect to the black community, right? So I was invited along with some other great generals of the gospel. Now, I did not know, Brother Gene, who was going to be there. As soon as I walked through the golden doors at the bottom of the elevator waiting to go up. I think this is at Trump Tower. Was Brother Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> See, this kind of parasocial obsession that he's got here for Kenneth Copeland is not healthy. Not healthy. And when I saw Brother Copeland. I immediately forgot that I was in Trump Towers. This this whole appearance that he's doing here is on the Victory Network, which is owned by Kenneth Copeland. Victory a thon, I guess. And and, and 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 I got to Brother Copeland and I said, Brother Copeland, you have blessed and touched my life and like you've done millions and I may never be this close to you again. And I had a now television network pin. Right. And I took it off and I said, Would you pray and anoint my network that God will bless it because at the time we were just starting and, and when you were going through some financial issues why because okay now here comes the persecution complex you ready to I mean he's already talked about how much he loves Kenneth Copeland and how much how close to God he's brought him now he's about to lay on the persecution he's so persecuted for being a Christian in America who loves God and loves Donald Trump because Time Magazine named me Donald Trump's top pastor. I don't remember that. Uh, maybe, but there were other pastors who I feel it would be much more appropriate to call Donald Trump's pastors, top pastors, like Kenneth Copeland. Hell, why not Copeland? He was up there. He was a Trump supporter, or is currently still a Trump supporter. We, and we, we literally lost about... 40 to 45 percent of our TV network contracts counseled within a matter of two two weeks. Wow. Oh, so persecuted, so mistreated, this poor guy. He said, I'm going to pray over your network. And out of nowhere, the worst he said, I was waiting for him to say, make this man a millionaire or something. You know, he just blessed my life. No, he said. You know, this, the saddest part about what he just said is that I think he believes that Copeland really could say that and make it happen. 
make this guy a millionaire. And he thinks that it would actually work that way. No, he said, whatever gates of hell that comes against your yeah. television network, yeah. he said, it will not prevail. Amen. Uh, Dr. David Jeremiah prayed that God would raise up a black leader. This is what he said, that God would raise up a black leader to stand beside Donald J. Trump and that God would lead this man right. of God to victory. And little did I know God appointed me to be that person. And I've been fighting that fight ever since. But Brother Copeland prayed a prayer that changed my life, made me a multimillionaire. Y'all not talking back to me. Yeah, come on. I what was it that Jesus said about wealth and stuff? Isn't he supposed to give his wealth away to the poor and follow Jesus? This guy is standing here bragging about being a multimillionaire. The hypocrisy doesn't even register in his brain, doesn't even connect with this guy. You can see. I can tell right now there are many people in here that are jealous of me right now. You got the spirit of, you got the spirit of jealousy. You got to remove that thing now. Yeah. This is so absurd. Just top to bottom. This whole thing is absurd. Sad part is people take him seriously. People believe him. This is on the Victory Network. He's not a nobody. Apparently Time Magazine named him Trump's top pastor. He's worked with Kenneth Copeland. Not just met him. Not just that once. That was just in 2015, I think, or 2016. He's worked with Copeland extensively since then. And this guy is slipping Seven Mountains Dominionism into everything. I'm really honestly glad that he lost his election to the South Carolina's 4th District. But I got to tell you, man, this guy is still eroding the institution, our societal institutions day by day to the best of his ability until we finally come to the point where it's possible to replace the Constitution with the Bible. That is his end goal, not just his, but pretty much everybody on the Victory Network, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Kenneth Copeland included, and they will not stop until they succeed. If you disagree with anything I've said, let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Telltale Atheist. Stampede122, McCarthyism, anyone? Absolutely, absolutely. That's, this guy wants McCarthyism back. He flat out said it. He wants the House of Un-American Activities Committee back, which is McCarthyism. That's what that is. That was the whole thing. It's insane. It's a blight on American society, on American history, and he wants it back. That's like a German person saying, I liked the days of Nazi Germany and I want that back. What is wrong with you? That was an evil, depraved, disgusting piece of history who in their right mind would ever stand for something like that? Mark Burns wants that back. Mark Burns wants McCarthyism back. Of course, don't get me wrong, McCarthyism was not as bad as 1930s or 40s Germany, but it was fascism. They were both fascism, and they were both evil at their core. They were both deeply harmful and destructive to society. Well, one was very obviously more destructive, but it's the same ideology, and it's absolutely evil. Thank you guys for coming and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and coffee cups and stuff on there. You can also check out my other channels. I have a Telltale Unfiltered YouTube channel where I go through long-form videos like Kent Hovind's seminar series, Jehovah's Witnesses' TV show, and televangelists prophesying about politics. And finally, you can check out my social media. If you have a question for me, the best way to ask it is to tweet it at me. I'm on there all the time so check it out all links are in the description as always anyways that's all i've got for you thanks for listening